Halo, First Strike, by Eric Nyland, Part 1 Chapter 1 0622 hours, August 30, 2552, Military Calendar UNSC Vessel, Pillar of Autumn, Epsilon Eridani System, near Reach Station Gamma Spartan 104, Frederick, twirled a combat knife his fingers nimble despite the bulky Mjolnir combat armour that encased his body. The blade traced a complicated series of graceful arcs in the air. The few remaining naval personnel on the deck turned pale and averted their eyes. A Spartan, wielding a knife, was generally accompanied by the presence of several dead bodies. He was nervous, and this was more than the normal pre-mission jitters. The team's original objective, the capture of a Covenant ship, had been scrubbed in the face of a new enemy offensive. The Covenant were en route to reach, the last of the United Nations Space Command's major military strongholds. Fred couldn't help but wonder what use ground troops would be in a ship-to-ship -ship engagement. The knife spun. Around him, his squadmates loaded weapons, stacked gear, and prepped for combat. Their efforts redoubled since the ship's captain had personally come down to the mustering area to brief the team leader, Spartan 117. But Fred was already squared away. Only Kelly had finished stowing gear before him. He balanced the point of the knife on his armoured finger. It hung there for several seconds, perfectly still. A subtle shift in the Pillar of Autumn's gravity caused the knife to tip. Fred plucked it from the air and sheathed it in a single, deft move. A cold feeling filled his stomach as he realised what the gravity fluctuation meant. The ship had just changed course. Another complication. Master Chief Spartan 117, John, marched to the nearest comm panel as Captain Key's face filled the screen. Fred sensed a slight movement to his right, a subtle hand signal from Kelly. He opened a private comm freak to his teammate. Looks like we're in for more surprises, she said. Roger that, he replied. Though, I think I've had enough surprises for one op. Kelly chuckled. Fred focused his attention on John's exchange with Key's. Each Spartan, selected from an early age and trained to the pinnacle of military science, had undergone multiple augmentation procedures, biochemical, genetic, and cybernetic. As a result, a Spartan could hear a pin drop in a sandstorm, and every Spartan in the room was interested in what the captain had to say. If you're going to drop into hell, CPO Mendez, the Spartan's first teacher, had once said, you may as well drop with good intel. Captain Keyes frowned on the ship's view screen, a non-regulation pipe in his hand. Though his voice was calm, the captain's grip on the pipe was white-knuckled tight as he outlined the situation. A single space vessel, docked in Reach's orbital facilities, had failed to delete its navigational database. If the nav data fell into Covenant hands, the enemy would have a map to Earth. Master Chief, the captain said. I believe the Covenant will use a pinpoint slip space jump to a position just off the space dock. They may try to get their troops on the station before the Super Mac guns can take out their ships. This will be a difficult mission. Chief, I'm open to suggestions. We can take care of it, the Master Chief replied. Captain Key's eyes widened and he leaned forward in his command chair. How exactly, Master Chief? With all due respect, sir, Spartans are trained to handle difficult missions. I'll split my squad. Three will board the space dock and make sure that nav data does not fall into the Covenant's hands. The remainder of the Spartans will go groundside and repel the invasion forces. Fred gritted his teeth. Given his choice, he'd rather fight the Covenant on the ground. Like his fellow Spartans, he loathed off-planet duty. The op to board the space dock would be fraught with danger at every turn. Unknown enemy deployment, no gravity, useless intel, 
no dirt beneath his feet. There was no question, though. The space op was the toughest duty, so Fred intended to volunteer for it. Captain Keyes considered John's suggestion. No, Master Chief, it's too risky. We've got to make sure the Covenant don't get that nav data. We'll use a nuclear mine, set it close to the docking ring, and detonate it. Sir, the EMP will burn out the superconductive coils of the orbital guns, and if you use the Pillar of Autumn's conventional weapons, the NAV database may still survive. If the Covenant search the wreckage, they may obtain the data. True, Keyes said, and tapped his pipe thoughtfully to his chin. Very well, Master Chief. We'll go with your suggestion. I'll plot a course over the docking station. Ready your Spartans, and prep two dropships. We'll launch you, he consulted with Cortana, in five minutes. Aye, Captain. We'll be ready. Good luck, Captain Keyes said, and the view screen went black. Fred snapped to attention as the Master Chief turned to face the Spartans. Fred began to step forward, but Kelly beat him to it. Master Chief, she said, permission to lead the space op. She had always been faster, damn her. Denied, the Master Chief said. I'll be leading that one. Linda and James, he continued. You're with me. Fred, you're Red Team Leader. You'll have tactical command of the ground operation. Sir, Fred shouted and started to voice a protest, then squelched it. Now wasn't the time to question orders, as much as he wanted to. Yes, sir. Now, make ready, the Master Chief said. We don't have much time left. The Spartans stood a moment. Kelly called out, Attention! The soldiers snapped to and gave the Master Chief a crisp salute, which was promptly returned. Fred switched to Red Team's all-hands freak and barked, Let's move, Spartans! I want gear stowed in 90 seconds and final prep in five minutes. Joshua, liaise with Cortana and get me current intel on the drop area. I don't care if it's just weather satellite imagery, but I want pictures, and I want them 90 seconds ago. Red Team jumped into action. The pre-mission jitters were gone, replaced with a cold calm. There was a job to do, and Fred was eager to get to work. Flight Officer Mitchell flinched as a stray energy burst streaked into the landing bay and vaporised a metre-wide section of bulkhead. Red-hot molten metal splattered the Pelican dropship's viewport. Screw this, he thought, and hit the Pelican's thrusters. The gunmetal green transport balanced for a moment on a column of blue-white fire, then hurtled out of the Pillar of Autumn's launch bay and into space. Five seconds later, all hell broke loose. Incoming energy bursts from the lead Covenant vessels cut across their vector and slammed into a commsat. The communications satellite broke apart, disintegrating into glittering shards. But hang on, Mitchell announced to his passengers in the dropship's troop bay. Company's coming. A swarm of seraphs, the Covenant's scarab-like attack fighters, fell into tight formation and arced through space on an intercept course for the dropship. The Pelican's engines flared and the bulky ship plummeted toward the surface of Reach. The alien fighters accelerated and the plasma bursts flickered from their gun ports. An energy bolt slashed past on the port side, narrowly missing the Pelican's cockpit. Mitchell's voice crackled across the comm system. Bravo 1 to knife 26. I could use a little help here. He rolled the Pelican to port to avoid a massive, twisted hunk of wreckage from a patrol cutter that had strayed too close to the oncoming assault wave. Beneath the blackened plasma scorches, he could just make out the UNSC insignia. Mitchell scowled. This was getting worse by the second. Bravo 1 to knife 26. Where the hell are you? He yelled. A quartet of wedge-shaped, angular fighters slotted into covering position on Mitchell's scopes. Long swords, heavy fighters. Knife 26 to Bravo 1. A terse female voice crackled across the comm channel. Keep your pants on. Business is good today. 
Too good. No sooner had the fighters taken escort position over his dropship than the approaching Covenant fighters opened up with a barrage of plasma fire. Three of the Pelican's four longsword escorts peeled off and powered toward the Covenant ships. Against the black of space, cannons flashed and missiles etched ghostly trails. Covenant energy weapons cut through the night and explosions dotted the sky. The Pelican and its sole escort, however, accelerated straight toward the planet. It shot past whirling wreckage, it rolled and manoeuvred as missiles and plasma bolts crisscrossed their path. Mitchell flinched as Reach's orbital defense guns fired in a hot, actinic flash. A white ball of molten metal screamed directly over the Pelican and its escort as they rocketed beneath the defense platform's ring-shaped superstructure. Mitchell sent the Pelican into the planet's atmosphere. Vaporous flames flickered across the ship's stunted nose, and the Pelican jounced from side to side. Bravo One, adjust attack angle, the longsword pilot advised. You're coming in too hot. Negative, Mitchell said. We're getting to the surface fast, or we're not getting there at all. Enemy contacts on my scopes at four by three o'clock. A dozen more Covenant Seraphs fired their engines and angled toward the two descending ships. Affirmative. Four by three. I've got him, Bravo One, the longsword pilot announced. Give him hell down there. The longsword flipped into a tight roll and rocketed for the Covenant formation. There was no chance that the pilot could take out a dozen Seraphs, and Knife 2-6 had to know that. Mitchell only hoped that the precious seconds 2-6 bought them would be enough. The Pelican opened its intake vents and ignited afterburners, plummeting toward the ground at 1,300 metres per second. The faint aura of flames around the craft roared from red to blinding orange. The Pelican's aft section had been stripped of the padded crash seats that usually lined the section's port and starboard sides, the life support generators on the firewall between passengers and pilot compartment had also been discarded to make room. Under other circumstances, such modifications would have left the Pelican Troop Bay unusually cavernous. Every square centimetre of space, however, was occupied. Twenty-seven Spartans braced themselves and clung to the frame of the ship. They crouched in their Mjolnir armour to absorb the shock of their rapid descent, Their armour was half a ton of black alloy, faintly luminous green ceramic plates and winking energy shield emitters. Polarised visors and full helmets made them look part Greek hero and part tank, more machine than human. At their feet, equipment bags and ammunition boxes were lashed in place. Everything rattled as the ship jostled through the increasingly dense air. Fred hit the comm and barked. Brace yourselves. The ship lurched, and he struggled to keep his footing. Spartan 087, Kelly, moved nearer and opened a frequency. Chief, we'll get that comm malfunction squared away after we hit planet side, she said. Fred winced when he realised that he'd just broadcast on Fleet Com 7. He'd spammed every ship in range. Damn it. He opened a private channel to Kelly. Thanks, he said. Her reply was a subtle nod. He knew better than to make such a simple mistake, and as his second in command, Kelly was rattled by his mistake with the comm too. He needed her rock solid. He needed all of Red Team frosty and wired tight, which meant that he needed to make sure he held it together. No more mistakes. He checked the squad's biomonitors. They showed all green on his heads-up display, With pulse rates only marginally accelerated, the dropship's pilot was a different story. Mitchell's heart fired like an assault rifle. Any problems with Red Team weren't physical. The biomonitors confirmed that much. Spartans were used to tough missions. UNSC High Command never sent them on any easy jobs. Their job this time was to get groundside, and protect the generators that powered the orbiting magnetic accelerator cannon platforms. The fleet was getting ripped to shreds in space, 
The massive Mac guns were the only thing keeping the Covenant from overrunning their lines and taking reach. Fred knew that if anything had Kelly and the other Spartans rattled, it was leaving behind the Master Chief and his hand-picked Blue Team. Fred would have infinitely preferred to be with Blue Team. He knew every Spartan here felt like they were taking the easy way out. If the ship jockeys managed to hold off the Covenant assault wave, Red Team's mission was a milk run, albeit a necessary one. Kelly's hand bumped into Fred's shoulder, and he recognised it as a consoling gesture. Kelly's razor-edged agility was multiplied fivefold by the reactive circuits in her Mjolnir armour. She wouldn't have accidentally touched him unless she meant it, and the gesture spoke volumes. Before he could say anything to her, the pelican angled, and gravity settled the Spartan stomachs. "'Rough ride ahead,' the pilot warned. The Spartans bent their knees as the pelican rolled into a tight turn. A crate broke its retaining straps, bounced, and stuck to the wall. The comm channel blasted static and resolved into the voice of the longsword's pilot. Bravo 2-6, engaging enemy fighters and taking heavy incoming fire. The channel was abruptly swallowed in static. An explosion buffeted the pelican and bits of metal pinged off its thick hull. Patches of armour heated and bubbled away. Energy blasts flashed through the boiling metal, filling the interior with fumes for a split second before the ship's pressurised atmosphere blew the haze out the gash in its side. Sunlight streamed through the lacerated Titanium A armour. The dropship lurched to port, and Fred glimpsed five Covenant Seraph fighters driving after them and wobbling in the turbulent air. Gotta shake him, the pilot screamed. Hang on! The pelican pitched forward, and her engines blasted in full overload. The dropship's stabilizers tore away, and the craft rolled out of control. The Spartans grabbed onto crossbeams as their gear was flung about inside the ship. It's going to be a hell of a hot drop, Spartans, their pilot hissed over the comm. Autopilot's programmed to angle. Reverse thrusters. G's are taking me out. I'll... A flash of light outlined the cockpit hatch, and the tiny shockproof glass window shattered into the passenger compartment. The pilot's biomonitor flatlined. The rate of the dizzying roll increased, and bits of metal and instruments tore free and danced around the compartment. Spartan 029, Joshua, was closest to the cockpit hatch, He pulled himself up and looked in. Plasma blast, he said. He paused for a heartbeat, then added, I'll reroute control to the terminal here. With his right hand, he furiously tapped commands into the keyboard mounted on the wall. The fingers of his left hand dug into the metal bulkhead. Kelly crawled along the starboard frame, held there by the spinning motion of the out-of-control pelican, She headed aft of the passenger compartment and punched a keypad, priming the explosive bolts on the drop hatch. Fire in the hole, she yelled. The Spartans braced. The hatch exploded and whipped away from the plummeting craft. Fire streamed along the outer hull. Within seconds, the compartment became a blast furnace. With the grace of a high-wire performer, Kelly leaned out of the rolling ship, her armor's energy shields flaring in the heat. The Covenant Seraph fighters fired their lasers, but the energy weapons scattered in the superheated wake of the dropping pelican. One alien ship tumbled out of control, too deep in the atmosphere to easily maneuver. The others veered and arced up back into space. Too hot for them, Kelly said. We're on our own. Joshua, Fred called out. Report. The autopilot's gone, and cockpit controls are offline, Joshua answered. I can counter our spin with thrusters. He tapped in a command. The port engine shuddered, and the ship's rolling slowed and seized. Can we land? Fred asked. Joshua didn't hesitate to give the bad news. Negative. The computer has no solution for our inbound vector. He tapped rapidly on the keyboard. I'll buy as much time as I can. Fred ran over their limited options. They had no parasails, no rocket-propelled drop capsules. That left them one simple choice. 
They could ride this pelican straight into hell, or they could get off. Get ready for a fast drop, Fred shouted. Grab your gear, pump your suit's hydrostatic gel to maximum pressure. Suck it up, Spartans. We're landing hard. Hard landing was an understatement. The Spartans and their Mjolnir armor were tough. The armor's energy shields, hydrostatic gel, and reactive circuits, along with the Spartans' augmented skeletal structure, might be enough to withstand a high-speed crash landing, but not a supersonic impact. It was a dangerous gamble. If Joshua couldn't slow the pelican's descent, they'd be paced. Twelve thousand meters to go, Kelly shouted, still leaning over the edge of the aft door. Fred told the Spartans, Ready and aft, jump on my mark. The Spartans grabbed their gear and moved toward the open hatch. The pelican's engines screamed and pulsed as Joshua angled the thruster cams to reverse positions. The deceleration pulled at the Spartan team, and everyone grabbed, or made, a handhold. Joshua brought what was left of the craft's control flaps to bear, and the pelican's nose snapped up. A sonic boom rippled through the ship as its velocity dropped below Mach 1. The frame shuddered and rivets popped. Eight kilometers and this brick is still dropping fast, Kelly called out. Joshua, get aft, Fred ordered. Affirmative, Joshua said. The pelican groaned and the frame pinged from the stress and then creaked as the craft shuddered and flexed. Fred set his armoured glove on the wall and tried to will the craft to hold together a little longer. It didn't work. The port engine exploded and the pelican tumbled out of control. Kelly and the Spartans near the aft drop hatch dropped out. No more time. Jump! Fred shouted. Spartans, go, go, go! The rest of the Spartans crawled aft, fighting the G-forces of the tumbling pelican, Fred grabbed Joshua, and they jumped. Chapter 2 0631 hours, August 30, 2552, military calendar. Epsilon Eridani system, unknown aerial position, planet, reach. Fred saw the sky and earth flashing in rapid succession before his faceplate. Decades of training took over. This was just like a parasail drop, except this time there was no chute. He forced his arms and legs open. The spread eagle position controlled his tumble and slowed his velocity. Time seemed to simultaneously crawl and race, something Kelly had once dubbed Spartan time. Enhanced senses and augmented physiology meant that in periods of stress, Spartans thought and reacted faster than a normal human. Fred's mind raced, as he absorbed the tactical situation. He activated his motion sensors, boosting the range to maximum. His team appeared as blips on his heads-up display. With a sigh of relief, he saw that all 26 of them were present and pulling into a wedge formation. Covenant ground forces could be tracking the pelican, Fred told them over the comm. Expect AA fire. The Spartans immediately broke formation and scattered across the sky. Fred risked a sidelong glance and spotted the pelican. It tumbled, sending shards of armor plating in glittering, ugly arcs before it impacted into the side of a jagged, snow-capped mountain. The surface of Reach stretched out before them, 2,000 meters below. Fred saw a carpet of green forest, ghostly mountains in the distance, and pillars of smoke rising from the west. He spied a sinuous ribbon of water that he recognised, Big Horn River. The Spartans had trained on Reach for most of their early lives. This was the same forest where C.P.O. Mendez had left them when they were children. With only pieces of a map and no food, water or weapons, they had captured a guarded pelican and returned to HQ. That was the mission where John now the Master Chief, had earned command of the group, the mission that had forged them into a team. Fred pushed the memory aside. This was no homecoming. UNSC Military Reservation 01478B Training Facility would be due west. And the generators? 
he called up the terrain map and overlaid it on his display. Joshua had done his work well. Cortana had delivered decent satellite imagery, as well as a topographic survey map. It wasn't as good as a spysat flyby, but it was better than Fred had expected on such short notice. He dropped a nav marker on the position of the generator complex and uploaded the data on the TACCOM to his team. He took a deep breath and said, That's our target. Move toward it, but keep your incoming angle flat. Aim for the treetops. Let them slow you down. If you can't, aim for the water, and tuck in your arms and legs before impact. Twenty-six blue acknowledgement lights winked, confirming his order. Overpressurize your hydrostatics just before you hit. That would risk nitrogen embolisms for his Spartans, but they were coming in at terminal velocity, which, for a fully loaded Spartan, was, he quickly calculated, 130 metres per second. They had to overpressurize the cushioning gel, or their organs would be crushed against the impervious Mjolnir armour when they hit. The acknowledgement lights winked again, although Fred sensed a slight hesitation. 500 metres to go. He took one last look at his Spartans. They were scattered across the horizon like bits of confetti. He brought up his knees and changed his centre of mass, trying to flatten his angle as he approached the treetops. It worked, but not as well or as quickly as he had hoped. One hundred metres to go. His shield flickered as he brushed the tops of the tallest trees. He took a deep breath, exhaled as deeply as he could, grabbed his knees and tucked into a ball. He overrode the hydrostatic system and overpressurized the gel surrounding his body. A thousand tiny knives stabbed him, pain unlike any he'd experienced since the Spartan II program had surgically altered him. The Mjolnir armor's shields flared as he broke through branches, then drained in one sudden burst as he impacted dead center on a thick tree trunk. He smashed through it like an armoured missile. He tumbled, and his body absorbed a series of rapid-fire impacts. It felt like taking a full clip of assault rifle fire at point-blank range. Seconds later, Fred slammed to a bone-crunching halt. His suit malfunctioned. He could no longer see or hear anything. He stayed in that limbo state and struggled to stay conscious and alert. Moments later, his display was filled with stars. He realised then that the suit wasn't malfunctioning. He was. Chief! Kelly's voice echoed in his head, as if from the end of a long tunnel. Fred, get up, she whispered. We've got to move. His vision cleared, and he slowly rolled onto his hands and knees. Something hurt inside, like his stomach had been torn out, diced into little pieces, and then stitched back together, all wrong. He took a ragged breath. That hurt, too. The pain was good. It helped keep him alert. Status, he coughed. His mouth tasted like copper. Kelly knelt next to him, and on a private comm channel said, Almost everyone has minor damage. A few blown shield generators, sensor systems, a dozen broken bones and contusions... Nothing we can't compensate for. Six Spartans have more serious injuries. They can fight from a fixed position, but they have limited mobility. She took a deep breath and then added, Four KIA. Fred struggled to his feet. He was dizzy, but remained upright. He had to stay on his feet no matter what. He had to for the team, to show them they still had a functioning leader. It could have been much worse but four dead was bad enough. No Spartan operation had ever seen so many killed in one mission, and this op had barely begun. Fred wasn't superstitious, but he couldn't help but feel that the Spartans' luck was running out. You did what you had to do, Kelly said as if she were reading his mind. Most of us wouldn't have made it if you hadn't been thinking on your feet. Fred snorted in disgust. Kelly thought he'd been thinking on his feet, but all he'd done was land on his ass. He didn't want to talk about it, not now. Any other good news? he said. Plenty, she replied. Our gear, munitions boxes, bags of extra weapons, 
They're scattered across what's passing for our LZ. Only a few of us have assault rifles, maybe five in total. Fred instinctively reached for his MA5B and discovered that the anchoring clips on his armour had been sheared away in the impact. No grenades on his belt, either. His drop bag was gone, too. He shrugged. We'll improvise, he said. Kelly picked up a rock and hefted it. Fred resisted the urge to lower his head and catch his breath. There was nothing he wanted to do more right now than sit down and just rest and think. There had to be a way to get his Spartans out of here in one piece. It was like a training exercise. All he needed to do was figure out how best to accomplish their mission with no more foul-ups. There was no time, though. They'd been sent to protect those generators, and the Covenant sure as hell weren't sitting around waiting for them to make the first move. The columns of smoke that marked where Reach Highcom once stood testified to that. Assemble the team, Fred told her. Formation Beta. We're heading toward the generators, on foot. Pack out our wounded and dead. Send those with weapons ahead as scouts. Maybe our luck will change. Kelly barked over the squad comm. Move, Spartans. Formation Beta to the nav point. Fred initiated a diagnostic on his armor. The hydrostatic subsystem had blown a seal, and pressure was at minimal functional levels. He could move but he'd have to replace that seal before he'd be able to sprint or dodge plasma fire. He fell in behind Kelly and saw his Spartans on the periphery of his tactical friend or foe monitor. He couldn't actually see any of them because they were spread out and darted from tree to tree to avoid any Covenant surprises. They all moved silently through the forest, light and shadow, and an occasional muted flash of luminous green armor, then gone again. Red 1, this is Red 12. Single enemy contact, neutralized. One here, too, Red 15 reported. Neutralized. There had to be more. Fred knew the Covenant never travelled in small numbers. Worse, if the Covenant were deploying troops in any significant numbers, that meant the holding action in orbit had turned ugly, so it was only a matter of time before this mission went from bad to worse. He was so intent on listening to his team's field checks, he almost ran into a pair of jackals. He instinctively melted into the shadow of a tree and froze. The jackals hadn't seen him. The bird-like aliens sniffed the air, however, and then moved forward more cautiously, closing on Fred's concealed position. They waved plasma pistols before them and clicked on their energy shields. The small, oblong protective fields rippled and solidified with a muted hum. Fred keyed his comm channel to Red 2, twice. Her blue acknowledgement light immediately winked in response to his call for backup. The jackals suddenly turned to their right and sniffed rapidly. A fist-sized rock whizzed in from the alien's left. It slammed into the lead jackal's occipital crest with a wet crack. The creature squawked and dropped to the ground in a pool of purple-black blood. Fred darted ahead and in three quick steps closed with the remaining jackal. He sidestepped around the plane of the energy shield and grabbed the creature's wrist. The jackal squawked in fear and surprise. He yanked the jackal's gun arm hard and then twisted. The jackal struggled as its own weapon was forced into the mottled rough skin of its neck. Fred squeezed, and he could feel the alien's bones shatter. The plasma pistol discharged in a bright emerald flash. The jackal flopped over on its back, minus its head. Fred picked up the fallen weapons as Kelly emerged from the trees. He tossed her one of the plasma pistols, and she plucked it out of the air. Thanks. I'd still prefer my rifle to this alien piece of junk, she groused. Fred nodded and clipped the other captured weapon to his harness. Beats the hell out of throwing rocks, he replied. Affirmative, Chief, she said with a nod, but just barely. Red One. Joshua's voice called over the squad comm. I'm half a click ahead of you. You need to see this. Roger, Fred told him. Red Team, hold here and wait for my signal. Acknowledgement lights winked on. In a half-crouch... 
Fred made his way toward Joshua. There was light ahead. The shade thinned and vanished because the forest was gone. The trees had been leveled, every one blasted to splinters or burned to charred nubs. There were bodies, too. Thousands of covenant grunts, hundreds of jackals and elites littered the open field. There were also humans, all dead. Fred could see several fallen marines still smouldering from plasma fire. There were overturned scorpion tanks, warthogs with burning tires, and a banshee flyer. The flyer had snagged one canid on a loop of barbed wire, and it propelled itself, riderless, in an endless orbit. The generator complex on the far side of this battlefield was intact, however. Reinforced concrete bunkers, bristling with machine guns, surrounded a low building. The generators were deep beneath there. So far it looked as if the Covenant had not managed to take them, though not for lack of trying. Contacts ahead, Joshua whispered. Four blips appeared on his motion sensor. Friend or foe tags identified them as UNSC Marines, Company Charlie. Serial numbers flashed next to the men as his HUD picked them out on a topo map of the area. Joshua handed Fred his sniper rifle and he sighted the contacts through the scope. They were Marines, sure enough. They picked through the bodies that littered the area, looking for survivors and policing weapons and ammo. Fred frowned. Something about the way the Marine squad moved didn't feel right. They lacked unit cohesion, with their line ragged and exposed. They weren't using any of the available cover. To Fred's experienced eye, the Marines didn't even seem to be heading in a specific direction. One of them just ambled in circles. Fred sent a narrow beam transmission on UNSC Global Frequency. Marine Patrol, this is Spartan Red Team. We are approaching your position from your six o'clock. Acknowledge. The Marines turned about and squinted in Fred's direction and brought their assault rifles to bear. There was static on the channel, and then a hoarse, listless voice replied, Spartans, if you are what you say you are, we could sure use a hand. Sorry we missed the battle, Marine. Missed? The Marine gave a short, bitter laugh. Hell, Chief, this was just round one. Fred returned the sniper rifle to Joshua, pointed toward his eye, and then to the Marines in the field. Joshua nodded, shouldered the rifle, and sighted them. His finger hovered near the weapon's trigger, not quite on it. It never hurt to be careful. Fred got up and walked to the cluster of Marines. He picked his way past a tangle of grunt bodies and the twisted metal and charred tires that had once been a warthog. The men looked as if they had been to hell and back, they all sported burns, abrasions, and the kilometre-long stare indicative of near shock. They gaped at Fred, mouths open. It was a reaction that he had often seen when soldiers first glimpsed a Spartan. Two metres tall, half a tonne of armour, splashed with alien blood. It was a mix of awe and suspicion and fear. He hated it. He just wanted to fight and win this war, like the rest of the soldiers in the UNSC. The corporal seemed to snap out of his near fugue. He removed his helmet, scratched at his cropped red hair, and looked behind him. Chief, you'd better head back to base with us before they hit us again. Fred nodded. How many in your company, corporal? The man glanced at his three companions and shook his head. Say again, chief? These men were likely on the verge of battle shock, so Fred controlled his impatience and replied in as gentle a voice as he could muster. Your FOF tags say you're with Charlie Company, Corporal. How many are you? How many wounded? There's no wounded, Chief, the Corporal replied. There's no company either. We're all that's left. Chapter 3 O six forty nine hours, August thirty, twenty five fifty two, military calendar. Epsilon Eridani System, Orbital Defense Generator Facility, A three three one, Planet Reach. 
Fred looked over the battlefield from the top of the southern bunker, his temporary command post. The structure had been hastily erected, and some of the fast-drying instacrete hadn't fully hardened. The bunker was not the best defensive position, but it gave him a clear view of the area as his team worked to strengthen the perimeter of the generator complex. Spartans strung razor wire, buried Antelon mine packs, and swept the area on patrols. A six-man fire team searched the battleground for weapons and ammunition. Satisfied that the situation was as stable as possible, he sat and began to remove portions of his armour. Under normal circumstances, a team of techs would assist in such work, but over time, the Spartans had all learned how to make rudimentary field repairs. He located a broken pressure seal and quickly replaced it with an undamaged one he'd recovered from Spartan 059's armour. Fred scowled. He hated the necessity of stripping gear from Malcolm's suit, but it would dishonour his fallen comrade not to use his gift of the spare part. He banished thoughts of the drop and finished installing the seal. Self-recrimination was a luxury he could ill afford, and the Red Team Spartans didn't have a monopoly on hard times. Charlie Company's surviving marines had held off the Covenant assault with batteries of chain guns, war togs, and a pair of scorpion tanks for almost an hour. Grunts had charged across the minefield and cleared a path for the jackals and elites. Lieutenant Buckman, the Marine CO, had been ordered to send the bulk of his men into the forest in an attempt to flank the enemy. He had called in air support, too. He got it. Reach Highcom must have realised the generators were in danger of being overrun, so someone panicked and sent in bombers to hit the forest in a half-click radius. They wiped out the Covenant assault wave. It also killed the lieutenant and his men. What a waste. Fred replaced the last of his armour components and powered up. His status lights pulsed a cool blue. Satisfied, he stood and activated the comm. Red 12, give me a sit rap. Will's voice crackled over the channel. Perimeter established, Chief. No enemy contacts. Good. Fred replied. Mission status? Ten chain guns recovered and now provide blanketing fields of fire around the generator complex, Will said. We've got three Banshee flyers working. We've also recovered 30 of those arm-mounted jackal shield generators, plus a few hundred assault rifles, plasma pistols, and grenades. Ammo? We need it. Affirmative, sir, Will said. Enough to last for an hour of continuous fire. There was a short pause, then he added... HQ must have sent reinforcements at some point, because we've recovered a crate marked Highcom Armory Omega. What's in it? Six Anaconda surface-to-air missiles. Will's voice barely concealed his glee. And a pair of Fury TAC nukes. Fred gave a low whistle. The Fury TAC nuke was the closest thing the UNSC had in its arsenal to a nuclear grenade. It was the size and shape of an overinflated football. It delivered slightly less than a megaton yield and was extremely clean. Unfortunately, it was also completely useless to them in this situation. Secure the ordnance ASAP. We can't use them. The EMP would fry the generators. Roger that, Will said with a disappointed sigh. Red 3? Fred asked. Report. There was a moment's hesitation. Joshua whispered, Not good here, Red One. I'm posted on the ridge between our valley and the next. The Covenant has a massive LZ set up. There's an enemy ship on station, and I estimate battalion strength enemy troops on the ground. Grunts, jackals, equipment, and support armor are deploying. Looks like they're getting ready for round two, sir. Fred felt the pit of his stomach grow cold. Give me an uplink. Roger. A tiny picture appeared in Fred's heads-up display, and he saw what Joshua had sighted through his sniper scope. A Covenant cruiser hovered 30 metres off the ground. The ship bristled with energy weapons and plasma artillery. His Spartans couldn't get within weapons range of that thing without being roasted. A gravity lift connected the ship to the surface of Reach, 
and troops poured out, thousands of them. Legions of grunts, three full squadrons of elites piloting banshees, plus at least a dozen wraith tanks. It didn't make much sense, though. Why didn't the cruiser get closer and open fire? Or did the Covenant think there might be another airstrike? The Covenant never hesitated during an assault, but the fact that he was still alive meant that the enemy's rules of engagement had somehow changed. Fred wasn't sure why the Covenant were being so cautious, but he'd take the break. It would give him time to figure out how to stop them. If the Spartans were mobile, they might be able to engage a force that size with hit-and-run tactics. Holding a fixed position was another story altogether. Updates every ten minutes, he told Joshua. His voice was suddenly tight and dry. Roger that. Red 2, any progress on that SATCOM uplink? Negative, sir, Kelly muttered, tension thickening her voice. She had been tasked with patching Charlie Company's bullet-ridden communications pack. There are battle reports jamming the entire spectrum, but from what I can make out, the fight upstairs isn't going well. They need this generator up, no matter what it's going to cost us. Understood, Fred said. Keep me. Wait. Incoming transmission to Charlie Company from Reach High Kong. High Kong? Fred thought headquarters on Reach had been overrun. Verification codes? They check out, Kelly replied. Patch it through. Charlie Company. Jake, what the hell is the hold up there? Why haven't you gotten my men out yet? This is Senior Petty Officer Spartan 104, Red Team Leader, Fred replied. Now in charge of Charlie Company, identify yourself. Put Lieutenant Chapman on, Spartan. An irritated voice snapped. That's not possible, sir, Fred told him, instinctively realising that he spoke to an officer and adding the honorific. Except for four wounded Marines, Charlie Company is gone. There was a long, static-filled pause. Spartan, listen to me very carefully. This is Vice Admiral Danforth Whitcomb, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations. Do you know who I am, son? Yes, sir, Fred said, wincing as the Admiral identified himself. If the Covenant were eavesdropping on this transmission, the senior officer had just made himself a giant target. My staff and I are pinned down in a gully southeast of where Highcom used to be, Whitcomb continued. Get your team over here and extract us. On the double. Negative, sir. I cannot do that. I have direct orders to protect the generator complex powering the orbital guns. I'm countermanding those orders, the Admiral barked. As of two hours ago, I have tactical command of the defensive reach. Now I don't care if you're a Spartan or Jesus Christ walking down the damned Bighorn River. I am giving you a direct order. Acknowledge, Spartan. If Admiral Whitcomb was now in charge of the defence, then a lot of the senior brass had been put out of commission when HQ got hit. Fred saw a tiny amber light flashing on his heads-up display. His biomonitor indicated an elevation in his blood pressure and heart rate. He noticed his hands shook, almost imperceptibly. He controlled the shaking and keyed the calm. Acknowledged, sir. Is air support available? Negative. Covenant craft took out our fighter and bomber cover in the first wave. Very well, sir. We'll get you out. Step on it, chief. The comm snapped off. Fred wondered if Admiral Whitcomb was responsible for the hundreds of dead marines who'd been trying to guard the generators. No doubt he was an excellent ship driver, but fleet officers running ground ops... No wonder the situation was foobar. Had he pressured a young and inexperienced lieutenant to flank a superior enemy? Had he sent in air support with orders to saturate bomb the area? Fred didn't trust the Admiral's judgment, but he couldn't ignore a direct order from him either. He ran his team roster up into his heads-up display. Twenty-two Spartans, six wounded so badly they could barely walk, and four battle-fatigued Marines who'd been through hell once already. They had to repel a massive Covenant force. They had to extract Admiral Whitcomb, too. And, as usual, 
Their survival was at best a tertiary consideration. He had weapons to defend the installations, grenades, chain guns and missiles. Fred paused. Perhaps this was the wrong way to look at the tactical situation. He was thinking about defending the installation when he should have been thinking about what Spartans were best at, offense. He keyed the squad com. Everyone catch that last transmission? Acknowledgement lights winked on. Good. Here's the plan. We split into four teams. Team Delta. He highlighted the wounded Spartans and the four Marines on the roster. Fall back to this location. He uploaded a tactical map of the area and set a nav marker in a ravine 16 kilometres north. Take two warthogs, but leave them and stealth it if you encounter any resistance. Your mission is to secure the area. This will be the squad's fallback position. Keep the back door open for us. They immediately acknowledged. The Spartans knew that ravine like the backs of their hands. It wasn't marked on any map, but it was where they'd trained for months with Dr. Halsey. Beneath the mountain were caverns that the Office of Naval Intelligence had converted into a top-secret facility. It was fortified and hardened against radiation, and could probably withstand anything up to and including a direct nuclear strike. A perfect hole to hide in if everything went sour. Team Gamma. Fred selected Red 21, Red 22, and Red 23 from the roster. You'll extract the Admiral and his staff and bring them back to the generators. We'll need the extra crew. Affirmative, Red 21 replied. Technically, Fred was following Whitcomb's order to extract him from his current position. What the Admiral didn't realise, though, was that he would have probably been safer staying put. Team Beta. Fred selected Red 20 through Red 4. You're on generator defence. Understood, Chief. Team Alpha. He selected Kelly, Joshua, and himself. Awaiting orders, sir, Joshua said. We're going to that valley to kill anything there that isn't human. Fred and Kelly faced the three Banshee flyers that had been dragged into the makeshift compound. Fred peered inside the cockpit of the nearest craft and tabbed the activation knob. The Banshee rose a metre off the ground, its anti-grav pod glowed a faint electric blue, and it started to drift forward. He snapped it off, and the Banshee settled to the ground. He quickly tested the other two, and they also rose off the ground. Good. All working. Kelly crossed her arms. We're going for a ride? A warthog pulled up and skidded to a halt in front of them, Joshua at the wheel. The rear held a half-dozen jackhammer missiles and a trio of launchers. A crate sat in the passenger's seat, one loaded with the dark emerald green duct tape that every soldier in the UNSC ubiquitously referred to as E.B. Green. "'Mission accomplished, sir,' Joshua said as he climbed from the warthog. Fred grabbed a launcher, a pair of rockets, and a roll of tape from the hog. We'll be needing these when we hit the Covenant on the other side of the ridge, he explained. Each of you, secure a launcher and some ammo in a banshee. Joshua and Kelly stopped what they were doing and turned to face him. Permission to speak, sir, Kelly asked. Granted. I'm all for a good fight, Fred, but those odds are a little lopsided, even for us. Like ten thousand to one. We can handle a hundred to one, Joshua chimed in. Maybe even 500 to 1 with a little planning and support. But against these odds, a frontal assault seems... It's not going to be a frontal assault, Fred said. He wedged the launcher into the cramped Banshee cockpit. Tape. Kelly ripped off a length of tape and handed it over. Fred smoothed the adhesive strip and secured the launcher in place. We'll play this one as quiet as we can, he said. She considered Fred's plan for a moment and then asked, So, assuming we fool them into letting us into their lines, then what? As much as I'd like to, we can't use the TAC nukes, Joshua mused. Not in the far valley. The intervening ridge isn't high enough to block the EMP. It'll burn out the orbital defense generator. There's another way to use them, Fred told them. We're going to board the cruiser, ride up its gravity lift, 
and detonate the nuke inside. The ship's shields will dampen the electromagnetic pulse. It'll also turn that ship into the biggest fragmentation grenade in history, Kelly remarked. And if anything goes wrong, Joshua said, we end up in the middle of a thousand pissed off bad guys. We're Spartans, Fred said. What could possibly go wrong? Chapter 4 Oh seven eleven 11 hours, August 30, 2552, military calendar. Epsilon Eridani system, Longhorn Valley, planet Reach. The alarm hooted, and Zowers sprang to his feet with a startled yelp. The squat alien, a grunt, clad in burnished orange armor, fumbled and dropped his motion scanner. He keened in fear and retrieved the device with a trembling claw. If the scanner had been damaged, the elites would use his body as reactor shielding. If his masters learned he'd been asleep at his post, they might do far worse than kill him. They might give him to the jackals. Zawas shuddered. Fortunately, the scanner still worked, and the diminutive alien sighed with relief. Three contacts rapidly approached the mountain that separated Zawas's cadre from the distant human forces. He reached for the warning klaxon, but relaxed, as his detector identified the contacts, Banshee Flyers. He peered over the dirt edge of his protective hole to confirm this. He spotted three of the bulbous aircraft on approach. Zowers snorted. It was odd that the flight wasn't listed on his patrol schedule. He considered alerting his superiors, then thought better of it. What if they were elites on some secret mission? No. It was best not to question such things. Be ignored. Live another day. That was his creed. He nestled back into his hole, reset the motion detector to long range, and prayed it wouldn't go off again. He curled into a tight ball and promptly fell into a deep sleep. Fred led their flying wedge formation. The purple and red airships arced up and over the treetops of the ridge, gaining as much altitude as the Banshee could manage, about 300 metres. As he cleared the top, what he saw made him ease off the throttle. The valley was ten kilometres across and sloped before him, thick with Douglas firs that thinned and gave way to trampled fields and the Bighorn River beyond. Camped in the fields were thousands upon thousands of Covenant troops. Their mass covered the entire valley, and thin, smoke-choked sunlight glinted off a sea of red, yellow, and blue armour. They moved in tight columns and swarmed along the river's edge, so many that it looked like someone had kicked over the largest ant hill in existence. And they were building. Hundreds of flimsy, white, dome-shaped tents were being erected, atmosphere pits for the methane-breathing grunts. Farther back, were the odd polyhedral huts of the elite units, guarded by a long line of dozens of beetle-like wraith tanks. Guard towers punctuated the valley. They spiralled up from mobile treaded bases, ten metres tall and topped with plasma turrets. The rules had indeed changed. In more than a hundred battles, Fred had never seen the Covenant set up encampments of such magnitude. All they did was kill. Floating behind all this activity, almost brushing against the far hills, the Covenant cruiser sat thirty metres off the ground. It looked like a great bloated fish with stubby stabilising fins. Its gravity lift was in operation, a tube of scintillating energy that moved matter to and from the ground. Stacks of purple crates gently floated down from the craft. In the afternoon light, he could see its weapons bristling along its length, casting spider-like shadows across its hull. Their banshees leveled out, and Fred dropped back to tighten his formation with Kelly and Joshua. He glanced again at the enemy ship and the guard towers. One good hit from those weapons could take them out. Fred saw other banshee patrols circling the valley. He frowned. If they passed them, the enemy pilots would almost certainly demand to know their business, and there was no way of knowing what the established patrol routes were. 
That meant he'd have to take an alternate flight path, straight down the middle and straight over the Covenant Horde. They'd only need one run to do this. They'd probably only get one run. He activated a comm frequency. Go. Kelly hit the acceleration and glided toward the cruiser. Fred fell in behind her. He armed the fuel rod gun built into the Banshee. They were six kilometers from the cruiser when Kelly achieved the maximum speed of her flyer. Grunts and jackals in the fields below craned their necks as the Spartans flashed over them. They had to go faster. Fred felt every Covenant eye watching them. He dived, trading his altitude for acceleration, and Joshua and Kelly did the same. Communication symbols flashed across his Banshee's windshield display. The UNSC software built into their armor worked only with some of the spoken Covenant languages, not their written words. Odd, curling characters scrolled across the Banshee's displays. Fred hit one of the response symbols. There was a pause, the display cleared, and dozens more symbols flashed, twice as fast. Fred clicked the display off. Three kilometers to go, and his heart beat so hard he heard it thunder in his ears. Kelly pulled slightly ahead of them. She was now thirty meters off the ground, gaining as much speed as she could, driving straight for the cruiser's gravity lift. The nearest guard tower tracked her, its plasma cannon flared and fired. Kelly's flyer climbed and banked to evade the energy fire. The bolt of superheated ionized gas brushed against her starboard fuselage. Energy spray melted the Banshee's front fairing and her ship slowed. A dozen plasma turrets turned to track them. Fred banked and opened fire. Energy bursts from the Banshee's primary weapon strafed the guard tower. Joshua did the same, and a river of fire streaked toward the towers. Fred hit the firing stud for the Banshee's heavy weapon, and a sphere of energy arced into the base of the tower. It began a gradual tilt, then collapsed. Kelly hadn't fired. Fred glanced her way and saw that she now stood in a low crouch atop her racing Banshee. She had one foot under the duct tape that had secured the nuke, and now held the bomb in her hands, cocking it back to throw. A shard of jagged crystal, around from a Covenant needler, pinged off Fred's port shield. He snapped a look below. Covenant grunts and jackals boiled in agitation. A hundred badly aimed shots arced up after him. Glistening clouds of crystalline needles and firefly plasma bolts swarmed through the air and chipped away at his banshee's fuselage. Fred jinked his banshee left and right and dodged plasma bolts from the three guard towers tracking him. He lined up for a second strafing run and the banshee's lighter energy weapons sent grunts scattering. A hundred meters to go. Kelly leaned back, coiled her body, and ready to throw the nuclear device as if it were a shot put. The Covenant cruiser came to life, and its weapons tracked the Banshees. A dozen fingers of plasma ripped the air. White-blue arcs of fire reached for them. One bolt connected with Joshua's ship. The Banshees' improvised shields overloaded and vanished. The canids of the flyer melted and bent. The alien airship lurched into a spin as its control surfaces warped, and Joshua fell behind Fred and Kelly just as they entered the gravity lift of the craft. Fred keyed his comm to raise Joshua, but got only static. Time seemed to slow inside the beam of purple light that ferried goods and troops to and from the belly of the ship. The strange glow surrounded them and made his skin tingle as if it were asleep. Their banshees rose toward an opening in the underside of the carrier. They weren't riding into the ship, though. They were travelling too fast and would cross the beam before they were three-quarters of the way to the top. Fred snapped around. He didn't see Joshua anywhere. Plasma beams hit the well and were reflected as if it were a giant glass lens. Kelly hurled the nuke straight up into the gullet of the cruiser. 
Fred wrenched the Banshee's controls and arced the craft under the edge of the ship. Kelly was right behind him. The light vanished, and they emerged on the far side of the Covenant vessel. Behind them, distorted through the gravity lift, Fred saw Covenant troops firing their weapons into the sky. He heard ten thousand voices screaming for blood. Fred pinged Joshua on the comm, but his acknowledgement light remained dark. He wanted to slow and turn back for him, but Kelly dived, accelerating toward the ground, and she entered the forest that carpeted the mountainside. Fred followed her. They were scant meters above the ground. They dodged trees and blasted through tangles of foliage. A handful of stray shots flashed overhead. They flew at top speed and didn't look back. They emerged from the tree line and over the powdered snow of the mountain top. They arced over a granite ridge, came about, and throttled back. The banshees drifted slowly to the ground. The sky turned white. Fred's faceplate polarized to its darkest setting. Thunder rolled through his body. Fire and molten metal blossomed over the ridge, boiled skyward, and rained back into the valley. The granite top of the intervening mountain shattered into dust, and the snow on their side melted in muddy rivulets. Fred's visor slowly depolarized. Kelly leaned across her banshee. Blood oozed from her armor's left shoulder joint. She fumbled for her helmet seal, caught it, and peeled it off her head. Did we get him? She panted. Blood foamed from the corner of her mouth. I think so, Fred told her. She looked around. Joshua? Fred shook his head. He got hit on the way in. It had been easy for him to fly into the face of certain death moments ago. Saying those words were a hundred times harder. Kelly slumped and dropped her head back against the banshee. Stay here. I'm going up to take a look. Fred powered up his banshee and rose parallel with the ridge line. He nudged the craft up a little farther and got his first look into the valley. It was a sea of flame. Hundreds of fires dotted the cracked, glassy ground. Where the Big Horn River had snaked along, there was now only a long, steaming furrow. There was no trace of the cruiser or the Covenant troop that had filled the valley moments ago. All that remained was a field of smouldering, twisted bone and metal. At the edge of this carnage stood blackened sticks, the remnants of the forest, all leaning away from the center of the explosion. Ten thousand Covenant deaths. It wasn't worth losing Joshua or any of the other Spartans, but it was something. Perhaps they had bought enough time for the orbital Mac guns to tip the battle overhead in the fleet's favor. Maybe their sacrifices would save Reach. That would be worth it. He looked up into the sky. The steam made it difficult to see anything, but there was motion overhead. Faint shadows glided over the clouds. Kelly's banshee appeared alongside his, and their canids bumped. The shadows overhead sharpened. Three Covenant cruisers broke through the clouds and drifted toward the generator complex. Their plasma artillery flickered and glowed with energy. Fred snapped open his comm channel and boosted the signal strength to its maximum. Delta team, fall back. Fall back now. Static hissed over the channel and several voices overlapped. He heard one of his Spartans, he couldn't tell who, break through the static. Reactor Complex 7 has been compromised. We're falling back. Might be able to save number 3. There was a pause as the speaker shouted orders to someone else. Set off those charges! Now! Fred switched to Fleetcom and broadcast. Be advised, Pillar of Autumn. Groundside reactors are being taken. Orbital guns at risk. Nothing we can do. Too many. We'll have to use the nukes. Be advised, orbital Mac guns will most likely be neutralized. Pillar of Autumn, do you read? Acknowledge. More voices crowded the channel, and Fred thought he heard Admiral Whitcomb's voice, but whatever orders he issued were incomprehensible. Then there was only static, and then the comm went dead. The cruisers fired salvos of plasma that burned the sky. Distant explosions thumped, and Fred strained to see if there was any return fire, 
any sign that his Spartans were fighting or retreating. Their only hope was movement. The enemy firepower would shred a fixed position. Fall back, he hissed. Now, damn it. Kelly tapped him on the shoulder and pointed up. The clouds parted like a curtain drawn as a fireball a hundred metres across roared over their position. He saw the faint outlines of dozens of Covenant battleships in low orbit. Plasma bombardment, Fred whispered. He'd seen this before. They all had. When the Covenant conquered a human world, they fired their main plasma batteries at the planet, fired until its oceans were boiled and nothing was left but a globe of broken glass. That's it, Kelly murmured. We've lost. Reach is going to fall. Fred watched as the plasma impacted upon the horizon and the sky turned white, then faded to black as millions of tons of ash and debris blotted out the sun. Maybe, Fred said. He gunned his banshee. Maybe not. Come on, we're not done yet. Section 1 Threshold